Representatives from the non-aligned movement expressed their solidarity with Venezuela at the organization's meeting in Caracas. Protests in Puerto Rico enter their seventh day as citizens demand the governor's resignation. And the South African government deploys troops in Cape Town in an attempt to quell gang violence. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, this is from the South, I am Doris Polo. The ministerial meeting of the Coordination Bureau of the Movement of Non-Aligned Countries is underway in Venezuela. High-ranking officials from 125 member countries across the world much. are meeting in the capital, Caracas. They were welcomed by the Venezuelan Foreign Minister, Jorge Areaza, who highlighted examples of interventionism around the world as the United States seeks to install servile governments. He added that the Bolivarian Republic is being punished for, quote, wanting to build its own model without interference. The president of Venezuela, Nicolas Maduro, addressed the assembly, highlighting the importance of the history of the non-aligned movement and praising the role of the organization and that it has played in creating a new multi-centric world. We can't forget the processes that led us here. And if we lose sight of history, it's difficult, almost impossible, to visualize the tasks ahead of us in the future. That's why it's so important that our non-aligned movement remains conscious of history and the historic forces that we carry within us. The immense role that the non-aligned movement has played, the immense role that the non-aligned movement has been called to play in order to open the way for humanity to create a new, multi-centric world. As our brother Xi Jinping, the president of China says, humanity is a community with a common destiny. We're in agreement on this. It may seem that humanity in peace without hegemony seems like a dream impossible to achieve. Some would say it's impossible to achieve a world without empires. We would remind them to look to the past and where we come from. There were those who said we would never have free, independent, and sovereign states and look at where we are now. The Nicaraguan Foreign Minister Dennis Moncada said that the meeting's objective was to ensure the stability, sovereignty and self-determination of the non-aligned countries. Through respecting international law and the sovereign rights of our countries, you respect the stability, sovereignty and the self-determination of our people, states and governments. That's the central objective for this meeting and the participation of the representatives, foreign ministers and the leaders of the delegations is very important. We hope to be able to strengthen the, op the position of the non-aligned movement in pursuit of peace, stability, work, and progress for our countries, and respect for international law, which is what facilitates living together in peace, tranquility, and stability. St. Vincent and the Grenadine Social Development Minister Frederick Stafferson highlighted the need to renew commitment to multilateralism and criticized unilateral United States economic sanctions. He added that the blockade on Cuba had been a failure. Canadians continue to unequivocally reject the imposition of national laws and regulations with extraterritorial reach and all other forms of cohesive economic measures, including illegitimate unilaterally imposed sanctions against countries such as Cuba and the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. By any measure, the economic blockade against Cuba is an unmitigated failure. These sanctions serve only to visit suffering on the peoples of both Caribbean nations and serve as a backdrop to a smattering, pandering politicians who value their individual electoral fortunes above international law and the weight of overwhelming global condemnation. 
Continuing with news on Venezuela, the country's Air Force intercepted a United States spy plane that entered its airspace on Friday. The U.S. aircraft was forced to change course and was escorted out of the region by Bolivarian Air Force fighter jets. The Venezuelan Defense Minister Vladimir Padrino Lopez said that the aircraft breached international civil aviation organization norms and the U.S. must abide by international law and put an end to such provocations. Shifting gears now, the power-sharing deal signed by the military and protest leaders in Sudan has not yet been put into effect. The opposition is divided over the deal, and further talks scheduled for Friday were briefly suspended to allow for internal consultation among parties. The Sudan Revolutionary Front has stressed the importance of a deal that helps the most marginalized in the country. We were here to develop the content to make sure that the issues which you consider uh, instrumental, issues such as the issues of peace, marginalization, issues of the uh, vulnerable people in Sudan, we were here to make sure that those issues uh, have been taken care of, have been well addressed, and uh, included in any, in any agreement. Unfortunately, uh, some parties in the FFC chose not to, to pay any attention to those issues and went ahead without uh, consulting their own colleagues. Meanwhile, the Sudanese Doctors' Committee has said that more than 200 people have been killed since the protests began. During a press conference, the committee confirmed that at least 246 people have died during the unrest over recent months. The highest number of casualties was recorded in June when a sit-in at the Defense Ministry was attacked by people wearing military uniforms. 246 people were killed up until April 9th, 15 were killed on the 11th, and 22 were killed after that date, including six victims in the incident on May 13th and 127 in the crackdown of June 3rd. Later, other 16 casualties in June 3rd during Ramadan. Thousands of people celebrated the 40th anniversary of the Sandinista Popular Revolution in Nicaragua yesterday. The event was attended by organized Sandinista bases from all across the country who caravaned to the capital for the commemoration. Nicaraguans were not only marking the revolution, this year is of particular significance as the country defeated the latest attempt at foreign intervention in 2018. President Daniel Ortega addressed the crowd and criticized the unilateral United States sanctions imposed on Nicaragua. We'll keep fighting. We'll keep fighting in order to achieve new victories on this 40th anniversary of the triumph of the revolution, which is also the first great anniversary of the triumph against the coup mongers. And we cannot accept sanctions, because for a sanction to be applied, it must be based in international law. And on the contrary, no state has the legal authority to sanction another state. The state that acts in that way is simply committing international crimes. Now, to mark the anniversary of the Sandinista Revolution, we've put together a special microsite timeline of events for you on the Telesur webpage. You can find the facts and history of one of the most important revolutionary victories in Latin America on our website, detailing events from the Somoza dictatorship beginning in 1936 through to the return of U.S.-supported violence in 2018 and the latest unilateral sanctions placed on Nicaragua. Coming up after the break, the Guyanese president says he's been acting in good faith with and to comply with the Caribbean Court of Justice ruling. Welcome back. Protests against Puerto Rican Governor Ricardo Rosello have entered their seventh consecutive day. 
Demonstrators are demanding the governor's exit from office after leaked social media messages revealed his sexist, racist and misogynistic language on July 13th. Trade unions and civil society organizations joined the protest on Friday. At least 14 people have been injured by police repression of the demonstrations. Roseo's administration has also been linked to corruption in recent weeks, with over $15 million of state funds reportedly having been stolen. Opposition parties in the Dominican Republic have taken to the streets to oppose the re-election of President Danilo Medina, who is hoping to lead the country for a third term. The surroundings of the National Congress once again became a stage for large demonstrations, this time against a constitutional reform that would allow President Danino Mandina to run for third term. We must comply with the Constitution. The President knows that the Constitution denies a third term in office, and he must comply with the oath he took in 2015 so that the Dominican people can live in peace. The Constitutionalist Military Foundation was also present to stand against the constitutional reform. In the Dominican Republic, the government has to determine whether they want us to keep living in a social and democratic state or if they want to bring a dictatorship back. Therefore, we ought to be responsible and respect our constitution. Demonstrations outside Congress show no sign of slowing down. Former President Dr. Linel Fernandez also came out to protest with a number of lawmakers and supporters. It's time for us to rescue the Dominican Republic, to establish a decent government that promotes ethics, morals, and basic values, so we all can live in equality and have the same opportunities. As dusk came, dozens of citizens held a candle at Daga at the under the slogans, we don't want re-elections and no more abuses of our constitution. Trinidad and Tobago's government says that there will be an expansive audit to determine whether multi-million dollar contracts have been given to gang leaders. The Minister of Rural Development and Local Government, Kazim Hussein, says he intends to address the allegations as a matter of urgency. This follows an investigative piece into a confidential police report which named seven reputed gang leaders who benefited from contracts from two state corporations. This report was published two days after the the police commissioner said the practice had fueled gang wars and contributed to the rise in homicides for 15 years. Guyana's president, David Granger, has said he has been acting in good faith to comply with the Caribbean Court of Justice ruling, meaning elections must be held within three months. The CCJ upheld a motion of no confidence in the government on July 18th, which had been passed in December 2018, but was then appealed. The ruling also means that a new chairman must be selected for Guyana's election commission. I would like to see the opposition sitting down with the government side and hammering out the list. This is what the CCJ asked us to do. And this is what I've been trying to do since the 10th to 12th of July. It is my firm conviction that the uh, orders, the consequential orders passed by the CCJ could result in an outcome which would benefit the Guyanese people as a whole by having uh, clean elections in as short a time as possible. I believe it's a good solution and I'm working to implement that decision. Meanwhile, the President Granger has left Guyana for Cuba, where he's been undergoing treatment for cancer. He's therefore a scheduled evaluation by doctors after he had been diagnosed with non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Granger celebrated his 77th birthday this week. Shifting gears now, members of Brazil's landless workers' movement's Marie Bibe camp held a funeral on Thursday night for murdered community member Luis Ferreira da Costa. Luis was hit by a truck while demonstrating for the right for the community's access to water. One person was arrested late on Thursday by the civilian police, having confessed to the crime, which injured several others. The organization is demanding an end to the targeted violence against rural workers and social movements. About 1,000 families live in the camp, which was occupied by the agrarian reform movement in April 2018, named in honor of slain Rio Councilwoman Franco.
Now more than ever, we must show our strength in unity, comrades. We must show all the authorities that here are people, a people with dignity and who fight, and we will not lower our heads. It was 8 in the morning in Valinos, and a thousand families from the Mariel camp of the Landless Workers Movement were handing out food and protesting. They've been occupying this idle land for a year. Suddenly, a pickup truck raced along the road towards them. Apparently, the driver was armed. He ran over 10 of the activists, including a 72-year-old bricklayer, Luis Ferreira. He bled to death as he arrived at the hospital. He has spent his whole life working, struggling and suffering for this country, and with so many kids around. A coward comes and does this. We are very sad. This has hit us really hard. The members of the MST had been demonstrating to demand their water supply be turned back on. It had been cut off by the mayor of Valencia, a region where agribusiness and gated communities consume large amounts of water. It's an hour and a half from Sao Paulo, the richest city in South America. Every day, Uriel spends an hour fetching water for his home. It's very difficult. When we had water, it was easier. They cut it off and everything got a lot worse. You can't live without water. Amid all the grief, the landless movement pointed to the federal government's responsibility in this crime, and they want justice from the local authorities. What happened here has a direct link to the political situation in Brazil today. President Jair Bolsonaro and the governor of Sao Paulo, Jao Doria, are responsible for this climate of hate. They have encouraged Brazilians to attack the social movements. The police have arrested a suspect who has confessed to the crime. The movement has called a protest in the region to protest against the wave of violence in the countryside. And still to come, former South African President Jacob Zuma rescinds a threat to pull out of a corruption inquiry. Don't go away. Welcome back. The South African National Defense Force has deployed soldiers in Cape Town to help quell escalating gang violence. We have more in this report from our correspondent in Maupin, Matuba Malachi. The sight of the army in a township is reminiscent of apartheid South Africa when the illegitimate government did everything to silence dissent. But now the government of the day is trying to deal with the ripples of apartheid. That's violent crime in the Western Cape province. I'm really thankful that, that they are here, the army are here. What? And I want to thank the government for making that good decision. The deployment of the army is happening some 1,000 kilometers away from the township you see behind me. But South African townships bear the same characteristics. This is where you'll find poor black people, high levels of unemployment, and this is also where you find high levels of violent crime. But the situation seems to be much more desperate in the Western Cape province. Hundreds of innocent people are often caught in the crossfire of gun battle of rival gangs in this part of the country. Because it's very dangerous, you must look over your shoulder, because when the guy shoots and you must go you run for your life. And you know that we're talking about the gangsterism that's happening here. And it's not here now, no, Park, it's all over. And I think it's about time that they, they assist us in this manner. We don't want to look like this anymore. The ongoing gang wars in the Western Cape province may have prompted the deployment of the army, but the wave of violent crime is felt all over South Africa, including here in Mabopane. But if history is anything to go by, we can remember in Brazil, in Mexico or even in Nigeria, the deployment of armies there never really produced a permanent solution to the violent crime. But we wait and see if South Africa will achieve a different result. I'm Matiwa Mashachi in Wabopane, South Africa for Telesur. 
That was Matuba Malaji with that report. Now, staying in South Africa, the former president, Jacob Zuma, has withdrawn a threat to pull out of an corruption inquiry, saying he will now proceed through written statements. Zuma's lawyers had earlier cited that their client was being treated as an accused person. However, after further meetings, the judge but overseeing the inquiry later said the former president agreed to proceed by way of written statements. That Protesters in Malawi have marched in the streets of Lelongwe demanding the chairperson of the Electoral Commission to resign. The protesters have accused Jane Ansa of mishandling the May presidential election won by Peter Mutarika. Nearly two months since the elections were held, political tension remains high as the results are being challenged in court by the opposition. The Constitutional Court is set to start hearing the case challenging on July 29th. Fellow Malawians, we are marching to the capital city to present our grievances. But on Tuesday, we will march to the State House and we will hold the vigil until Jane Ansa resigns. Land grabbing, the reduction of communal pastures, and the increasingly severe impact of climate change are triggering more and more severe intercommunity conflict in Kenya's Rift Valley. This is the Pokot ethnic group. They spend most of the day in the shade next to a road that hardly anyone uses. They say they no longer have any cows but goats, which they have to take very far to graze. The goats, the cows, they're all dead. Cattle thieves are gradually bringing insecurity to the east of the lake, and people have been blaming the Pokots for this crime for more than 10 years. But they say the bandits come from the north, and they don't know who they are, although they recognize that there is a land conflict. Even in the city, there are thieves and bandits. Although they might be few in number, they need to return to their own communities. The girls, who don't speak Swahili because they haven't gone to school, are trying to earn money by burning coal, but they don't reveal anything. The only thing the girl says is that you shouldn't bother them because they're hungry. We don't have seeds to plant crops. People want the government to at least provide seeds because we cannot afford to buy them. People here simply don't have the money. We don't even have the manpower to plant herbs and take care of the pastures. There's a tourist hub owned by a Mazungo businessman on one of the islands and a five-star hotel on another where you can pay up to $400 a night to admire an ecosystem full of crocodiles, hippos, eagles and many different species of birds. And this other island is home to an ambitious conservation plan led by a U.S. government-funded organization. They've introduced seven giraffes and some ostriches on the island so far, but there are also plans to bring some lions. But the future of these Islands is uncertain as there is armed conflict on the other side of the border. People of the Ilkamas ethnicity, who once founded Mukutanim village, are now just sitting on the rocks displaced from their homes. We came from the other side of the island. We had to flee because of cattle theft and conflicts. They want pastures only for themselves. That's the main reason. The main reason. The tourism management ignores the community's talents, and here they can't cultivate the land or take care of cows, so they practically have nothing to do. Since we're on this side, we stay at home with nothing to do. We have no orchards, and we don't have cows to breed. The elders want to return to Mukatanim village, but there are safety concerns. Their main challenge is to send the younger generation to school. Tourist companies and conservation organizations have been promising to launch scholarships, but they rarely keep their word. We pray to God to at least get a conservation model that is very serious and co-productive. From the Baringo Lake, Oscar Epelde, Telesur. And finally, the Algerian football team are celebrating the second Africa Cup of Nations triumph on the streets of Algiers. Algeria beat Senegal 1-0 through a fluke second-minute deflected goal from Bagad Bunja, breaking Senegalese hearts. Algeria sat back and scrapped out the win, but endured a scare when Senegal was awarded a second-half penalty only for the decision to be revoked by the video assistant referee.
And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Doris Polo. Thank you for watching.